Are we? Yeah. Okay, um, welcome to uh, this uh, first uh, Origin Center uh, webinar. Um, so we're the Origin Center of the Netherlands and uh, we started as a result of the National Science uh, Agenda. And um, the idea of the Origin Center uh, of the Netherlands is um, to build a large network within the Netherlands that is focused on uh, questions uh, related to the origin and evolution uh, of life on Earth um, and in the universe. Uh, so if you're interested in more about the Origin Center, please uh, check our website, origincenter.nl. Uh, um, so today you're here um, for our first webinar uh, by Professor Charles Coquel. Um, and Charles Coquel is, um, well, he's a lot actually. So he's an uh, uh, astrobiologist, but he started out as a, a biochemist and um, then he migrated into um, uh, microbiology, but also biophysics. Um, and he studied a lot of aspects uh, on life, but also life in extreme environments. Uh, he studied life on Mars. Um, and he's also working on uh, 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 studying life outside the Earth, for example, on the International Space Station, uh, what he's going to talk about today. Um, so he's worked on the many different projects uh, related to science, but he also does a lot of outreach. Um, and for example, he's also worked on outreach uh, projects with uh, with people who are in jail and giving them kind of a different perspective on life outside jail from uh, for when they come out. So he's a very broad uh, scientist and we're very happy uh, to have him here today at our first uh, webinar. Um, and with this, I would like to give the floor to uh, Professor Charles Kogel. Great. Thank you very much, Inga. And I'm really delighted to be here and thank you for inviting me to speak to the centre. It's really exciting to talk to the centre. I know I was going to say it's sort of a new centre, but I, actually it's been a while now since you set it up. Time flies and it seems like it's going all very successfully and it's, it's a real privilege to talk to you. So today I'm going to talk about something um, a little bit more sort of practical applied astrobiology. So let me do the first necessary piece of tech on virtual talks, which is to share my screen. First challenge. Can you see that? Yes. Excellent. Um, so what I want to do today is, is talk about an experiment we have uh, flown to the International Space Station. We flew it last year in the summer and we're flying another experiment in about three weeks in December. And actually it's about biomining, which is a very applied use of microbes in space. I'll explain what this is about in a moment. But in the course of um, discussing this, I will also talk about how this work might be applied to, for example, the search for biosignatures on other planets, such as, for example, the search for life on Mars. So this work does have some sort of fundamental application to astrobiology as well as, well as applied applications. I thought I'd talk about this just because some of you might be thinking in future about flying space experiments. There are increasing opportunities to do this through the European Space Agency and other uh, commercial space routes. So for those of you who have a, an interest in carrying out either applied or fundamental science experiments in space. This will give you a little bit of an understanding of planning and implementing a space station experiment. So in some sense, this is a little bit of a tutorial as well as a description of primary scientific data. And before I go any further, I'm gonna play a video that NASA made about our BioRock project uh, that flew last year. It's a very nice video, it's very nicely made, but it also summarizes the, the applied part of this whole uh, project. So it's a good way to start this talk. And then I will transition into um, to discussing the data. So let me just play this to you and hopefully you can hear the, the sound. The International Space Station will soon host some of the smallest miners in the universe, microbes. Microbes growing on the surface of rocks can gradually break them down and extract useful minerals and metals. This is a process called biomining. As we explore space, we are seeking to use biomining to turn rock and regolith into soil for growing plants and food. But before we can use this technique in planetary settlements, we first need to test it in space. On the space station, bioreactors will be placed inside a centrifuge where microbes will grow on rocks in microgravity and simulated Martian gravity. 
investigators will examine how three types of microbes behave within pieces of basalt and evaluate how well the different microbes extract elements from the rocks. The findings will be compared to ground-based results. We hope to gain insights into how microbes interact with rocks and microgravity and how we might use them in our exploration of deep space. Okay, so that's just a, a very public video, but, but a nice summary, I think, of what we were doing. And underpinning this is, is an understanding of the interactions of microbes with rocks, which some of you may better know as as geomicrobiology. So this is fundamental science, but being applied. So, so how might we use micro-mineral interactions and an understanding of these in, in exploring and settling space? How can we apply this astrobiology or geomicrobiology knowledge? This is just a review paper that's now, gosh, 10 years old. But there's a diagram that I put in here just describing some of the ways in which micro-mineral interactions and our knowledge of those can be useful for thinking about uh, extending the human presence beyond the Earth. So we've just spoken in this video about biomining, which is what I'm going to talk about. I should say the video I just showed you is in the future tense. That's now happened, and I'm going to present the data in this talk. We could also use microbes to control soils, for example, in, in greenhouses, uh, forming biological crusts to control the movement of dust and soils. We could use rocks in life support systems. So rocks, of course, are a source of nutrients, and instead of bringing those nutrients from Earth, we could just use regolith on the Moon and Mars as a source of key macronutrients and trace elements and shovel that into a life support system to grow microbes. Uh, we could also use microbes to ameliorate regolith to make soil for, for crops. That was mentioned in the video. We could also use microbes in microbial fuel cells uh, looking for uh, the idea of producing energy. And then, of course, on Mars, where we're interested in exploring uh, ancient water-rich environments for life, the way in which microbes alter rocks and create biosignatures of their presence has fundamental applications in trying to search for evidence of, of that life. So microbe-mineral interactions might seem a slightly esoteric, uh, very specialist area of study, but in fact, it has many types of applications, both in, in as I say, in fundamental science and applied science. And this is what motivates us to uh, have an interest in, in this field. Now, you might think, you know, why would we think that microbes would, would change in space? Why can't we just look at geomicrobiology on the Earth and just end our research there? Well, just to summarize, we know that microbes can be affected by changes, for example, in the gravity regimes in space, as well as, of course, factors like radiation. But I'm going to focus on gravity here. Mm -hmm. Most microorganisms are too small, or at least we think they're too small, to directly detect gravity. Most of them are about a micron in size. But gravity has an effect on fluids. So in microgravity, where essentially you've got no gravity or very little gravity, you haven't got sedimentation of microbes. They don't settle out. And you haven't got convective mixing. So fluid just tends to sit there. And in those conditions, microbes tend to use up the nutrients around the outside of the cell and the, the lack of fluid movement means that waste products are not being washed away. And that can stress microorganisms and cause them to grow in different ways. So although the microbes are not detecting micro, uh, microgravity, the fluid in which they are growing uh, is responding to differential gravity. And this is just some work by Kim et al, who showed how microgravity resulted in these uh, unusual shapes of biofilms, these layers of microbes on rocks and in um, microgravity, they observe these strange column and canopy shaped biofilms, probably caused by changes in, in fluid flow in microgravity or lack of fluid flow in microgravity. So based on this knowledge of how microbes are altered by the space environment, particularly the gravity environment, we might pose a science question. If microgravity changes or, or partial gravity changes the way in which microbes interact in fluid, how would gravity influence the way in which microbes interact with rocks. And our hypothesis might be that gravity would change both the way in which organisms interact with rocks and then what they can do um, with those rocks, whether that's biomining or breaking them down to make soils. So this was the concept behind the BioRock experiment. Uh, 
Now, just to horrify you, I wrote this proposal in 2008 and the experiment flew last year, so it was 11 years. But the good news is that you younger people are doing your postdocs and PhDs, uh, PhDs are living in a different era where you can fly these experiments uh, in much less time. So in fact, the bioasteroid experiment that we're flying next month took us a year to plan, implement and fly. So the paradigm is changing. And that means that doing these sorts of experiments has become a lot more realistic. And if you are enthusiastic about doing space experiments, you might um, consider embarking on these sorts of experiments. Just a political slide, this is BioRock. We have uh, collaborators uh, across uh, Europe. Uh, ESA implemented the experiment. Kaiser Italia built the hardware. Our collaborators in DLR and, and uh, SCKCN in Belgium provided two of the microorganisms. And we have collaboration with Kai Finster at Aarhus. But that's just to show you that these sorts of experiments become highly collaborative because you're working across many institutions. So the first thing we had to do is to build a miniature biomining reactor or a reactor that allows us to study micro mineral interactions in space. This is exciting to us because it means that we can use this uh, from this point on to look at all sorts of scientific questions that interest us um, to do with micro mineral interactions. I won't spend too long on this because it's more technical than scientific, but it's just interesting to explain uh, how this was designed. We designed a reactor. So you've got these two culture chambers that you can see on the left-hand side. And they're quite cleverly designed by Kaiser because they've got this membrane that you can see on the right that's inverted. And at the bottom here, we've got our basalt slide. This is the rock that we were studying in BioRock. I'll come back to this in a moment. You take these up to space station and the microbes are dried down on the rock. And then the, uh, the bioreactor is activated and medium is injected from the body of the reactor into the two culture chambers. And the, me and the uh, membrane flips open and liquid is injected in, and now the microbes become active. And we do this because we want the microbes to be active in the correct gravity conditions and not active when they're flying up into space. And then after three weeks, we also have a fixative chamber in here that is automatically triggered, and that injects fixative, kills the bacteria, stops the experiment, and then we can fly it down to the Earth and do our analysis. So this is the biomining reactor, this is a crucial part of doing a space experiment, is to have a piece of hardware that works. And that turns out actually to be a, a non-trivial matter. But I'm not going to say anything more about that. If anyone is interested in the story behind this, I can certainly uh, tell you more about it. We have three microorganisms, Sphingomonas desicabilis, Bacillus subtilis, and Cupriavidus metallidurans. Now, one of the things that's lacking, in, at least in my view, in space microbiology experiments is really good comparisons between microorganisms. People tend to do experiments in different apparatus at different times. It's very difficult to read papers and make comparisons. So we were quite excited here about the opportunity to compare multiple microorganisms in the same apparatus and in the same experimental conditions. And I think this is probably a good direction for space microbiology to make these comparisons. We chose these three microbes because they come from natural rock environments. They are desiccation resistant, which is necessary to fly them up to ISS, and they can all be grown in the same medium, which in our case was R2A, which is just a, um, a conventional name for this uh, organic medium. So, so now we've got these microbes that will all grow in the same conditions and can be flown to space station. Uh, all of these are heterotrophs, and all of them are able to form biofilms on rocks. So these are our three microbes. Just to say something about the rock that we studied for biomining, we chose basalt because this is a common rock type found on most of the moon and large areas of Mars as well. These are just a picture of the moon and Mars. Most of these two planetary bodies are, are made of basalt. This is not material that you would find on asteroids. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but what we wanted to do here was to see whether we could um, extract interesting elements out of common material elsewhere in space. And on the right middle there, you can see the two slices of basalt and they fit into the back of the bioreactor and then the metal plate goes over the top. This is just showing you the content of the basalt. Nothing very special here. Uh, any of you who are, who are geoscientists will see that the uh, silica content about 47% or thereabouts and the iron content about 12%. This is a typical basalt. This actually came from Iceland and was provided by um, Aarhus University. 
So this is the scheme of the experiment. Again, this is a more of a technical point, but I just thought I'd point this out to you. One of the things that you will learn if you do space experiments is it's really important to keep things simple. When I first started this experiment, we had six microorganisms. We had light to do photosynthetic analysis. And I now look back on that and think I must have been crazy when I wrote that proposal because these things are difficult to fly. And in this case, we've got three microorganisms. We've also got a negative control, which is simply the basalt and the medium, but without microbes. And of course, we've got all of those in triplicate because we want at least the minimum statistical replication in the experiment. We studied microgravity, simulated Martian gravity, but also terrestrial one gravity, uh, terrestrial gravity on the space station as a control, and then also ground experiment at 1G as a 1G control. And I just wanted to point out that we've got two 1G controls because the ISS 1G control takes into account things like the slightly higher radiation in space, vibrations on the space station. So you really want a 1G control, even in the space environment to compare to your gravity on the earth. So you can see even with this relatively simple experiment, we've got 48 bioreactors and uh, um, flying into space. There's a lot of um, 38, sorry, 38 bioreactors flying into space. So this is quite a large experiment, even with just three microorganisms and three gravity conditions and, and replication. So we built our experiment. We flew it uh, last August on SpaceX commercial resupply mission um, 18. Uh, the, nothing scientific here, just our holiday snaps at Kennedy. Very exciting after you spent nine years planning a space experiment to finally get to Kennedy and assemble the space experiment and, and launch it up into space. Um, I can't explain how exciting it is to see a spacecraft knowing that your little dried up microbes are sitting in that spacecraft and watch them docking with a space station in Earth orbit. Um, I know that probably sounds all very geeky and overexcited, but it's really, really exciting after you spent a long time uh, planning this experiment. As I say, these, these opportunities, particularly through SpaceX, are becoming quite common. So you should really, if you're excited about this, um, think about planning these experiments. Uh, we had an astronaut assigned to us, Luca Parmitano, who's uh, an Italian astronaut who was up there at the time. And this is him inserting the bioreactors into the cubic incubator. So this is the apparatus that we used to do the experiment. Um, on the next slide, you can just see the layout here. We've got slots on the outside where we can put the microgravity experiments. So they're not being exposed to gravity. And then in the interior of this incubator is a centrifuge. And in one of the centrifuges, we, we set the centrifuge to 3 8 gravity, so Martian gravity. And in the other centrifuge, we set it to one gravity to simulate Earth gravity. So we had two cubic incubators being used uh, for this experiment. And then we ran it for 21 days, injected the fixative, and then flew it back down to Earth. We were running a ground experiment in parallel with the space experiment, so we did this at the NASA Ames Research Center. Nothing particularly exciting in this image, but this is just the ground experiment occurring at NASA Ames. And then when the experiment came back from space, we drove down to Long Beach Airport in LA and, and literally just picked it up um, immediately after it had come out of the Dragon capsule and took it back up to Ames where we extracted the liquid and prepared it in nitric acid to do our experimental studies. So that's really how the experiment works. Again, if anyone's interested in knowing the mechanics of planning a space experiment, I'm happy to discuss that either after this talk or any other time. So two objectives were to look at bioleaching. We did this by removing the fluid from the apparatus and using um, ICP MS, inductive, inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry to measure all of the elements in the fluid. We also studied the growth of biofilms over the surface of the rock. We wanted to understand, similar to the Kim et al. experiments, what the effects of the different gravity was on biofilms. I'm not going to talk about the biofilm data. That is nearly a work in progress. I'm going to talk about these data that, as I told Inga, is actually by coincidence being, being published in what, 40 minutes from now, the embargo ends on our nature communications paper on the biomining experiment. So you can download that uh, at the end of this talk. So that's exciting. So today is um, uh, good timing, at least for this work. I want to present just some data that we obtained on the mining of rare earth elements from basaltic rock. Now, rare earth elements are a collection of, of lanthanides and also scandium and yttrium. 
that are used in a whole range of uh, high technology industries. And it's partly because of their electronic configurations. Some of them have magnetic properties and fluorescent properties that they find wide diversity. And this is just a list of things that I'm not going to go through, but anything from lasers. If you've ever come across those really powerful magnets that sometimes you find in, uh, you know, you, you can buy online. Uh, they have neodymium in that, that makes these sort of small high power magnets, aircraft engines, a whole range of high technology industries. In fact, if you want to build a permanent human presence beyond the earth, you will probably need rare earth elements. And the question is, do you, uh, do you call Elon Musk and ask him to launch several hundred kilograms of rare earth elements into space? Or do you try and mine these things in situ in space? So this is what we were interested in looking at. So we can measure these uh, by taking the liquid and um, measuring it using um, ICPMS, I'll come back to in a moment. Here are the concentrations of the rare earth elements in the basalt in parts per million. I'm gonna talk about these creep rocks on the moon that have rare earth elements about 10 times higher than normal basalt. These are very interesting and they cover the Oceanus Procellarum region on the near side of the moon. That big dark patch on the moon essentially is enriched in rare, rare earth elements. I want to point out right away that the Rare earth elements in space, in basalt on the moon, are still about 100 times lower than the best rare earth element um, ores that we have on the earth, for example, in China. So just to emphasize right from the get go, it is not economical yet to go and mine elements in space and bring them back to the earth. In fact, I don't know of a single element yet where it is economically element to do that in the present day. So this is really about can we use bio mining and mining to extract elements um, in space to support a human presence that's already there. So, so quite contrary to, to what it may look like, rare earth elements are not rare and they're not rare on the earth. So that's just something to point out. Uh, they're a misnomer, but they're very interesting. So this is the work I want to present. Uh, this is where we managed to demonstrate uh, extraction of rare earth elements in microgravity and Martian gravity from these basaltic rocks. These are just plots that I'm going to move on to the next slide where I can look at these data a bit better than this. But we have these plots where you can see the different microorganisms, the different gravity levels and the ground experiments and the nanograms of material in the containers. So just remember, this is not commercial bio mining. It's a scientific experiment. Five milliliters of liquid, nanograms of rare earth elements. So very, very small quantities. But nevertheless, uh, this allows us to do a proof of concept and to study their extraction. So these are some graphs with uh, measuring the mean extraction of rare earth elements as a percentage of the control. So 100% is the same as the control. And above that means that we've had biologically enhanced leaching, 14 rare earth elements. Um, this will be painful to your eyes because there's no, um, there's no uh, error bars, but I will come back to the statistics in a moment. The only reason why there aren't error bars here is because they're large if you plot them on all on these, you just end up with a big vertical line that is completely meaningless with lots of little ticks. So I'm showing you the mean here just to make some points. And the point is that Sphingomonas desicarbolis was able to um, cause an increase in the mean and statistically significant leaching of rare earth elements in microgravity, Martian gravity, and, and earth gravity. And the other two organisms were not. I'll come back to that in a moment. This is in space in the lower part of this graph. Again, rare earth elements on the x-axis, extraction on the y-axis. This is the ground experiment of the three different organisms. And you can see this increase in extraction of rare earth elements. Now, there's something interesting about this. Not only do, does Sphingomonas desicarbolis increase rare earth element extraction, it also has a preference for the extraction of the heavy rare earth elements over here on the right-hand side compared to the light rare earth elements um, like cerium. Uh, so for example, um, erbium and other elements on the right hand side here are preferentially um, extracted. Why is this the case? I'll come back to this in a moment. So first of all, we want to know, you know, what is it that is uh, causing this rare earth element extraction? So I'm going to come back to that in a second. First of all, just let me say something about statistics, just for the sake of some scientific rigor here. Um, we saw statistically significant differences in biological leaching between Mars gravity and Earth gravity. Um, compared to the controls. In other words, there was uh, enhanced leaching, but not in microgravity. But what's interesting is that the microgravity uh, showed um, 
still a mean increase in the the increase in the in the leaching compared to the control experiment. Why did we not see a significant difference between the samples? Well, one of the reasons was unfortunately in the microgravity experiment we lost one of the microgravity controls. It got contaminated. So in fact, we only had n equals two in the microgravity control, and as a result, the standard deviation was much higher. And we think that's the reason why we didn't see a statistically significant increase, but there was still a mean increase in the, um, in the leaching. When we compared the data across gravity conditions, we found that the bioleaching between gravity conditions, so now comparing microgravity to Martian gravity to Earth gravity, showed no significant difference between the different uh, gravity conditions for the organisms. In other words, to answer the hypothesis, we did not find a significant effect of gravity, at least in terms of statistically significant difference between the uh, different gravity regimes. And so you could conclude that in principle, rare earth element bioleaching can be successfully carried out in diverse gravity regimes. That's not to say that the mean leaching will not be different, but there's no statistically significant difference between these gravity conditions. So why, why was this not the case? Well, part of our experiment was um, also to look at the total concentrations of cells um, in, the, uh, in the experimental apparatus. And one of the things that we noticed is that at the end of the experiment, the final cell numbers were not different between the different gravity conditions. And these are some data that, that Rosa Santo Martino, my postdoc, recently published from our experiment in Frontiers, simply showing that there was no effect of gravity, no significant effect of gravity on the leaching of elements. So what, why is this the case, given what I said earlier about the effects of fluid? Well, it's an interesting question, and we're not sure. But one hypothesis we have is that the growth rate of the microbes might well have been different during the course of the experiment. But by the end of three weeks, and I should say this is one of the longest running microbiology experiments conducted in space station, at the end of three weeks, perhaps the growth of the microbes had reached stationary phase and they had overcome any effects of gravity. And as a result, they were able to do bioleaching at the same level because there were the same numbers of microbes in each reactor. So we can't rule out an effect of gravity during the growth phase caused by different fluid behaviors. But certainly by the end of this experiment, the microbes had managed to reach a stationary phase that was the same in all gravity conditions. And that might be the explanation for our data. And it has implications for bioprocessing in space simply because it shows that uh, ultimately you can grow cells to a certain level of, of productivity without affecting your ability to do something like biomining. The other thing I want to point out is this strange and interesting biosignature of the increase of rare earth elements, these heavier rare earth elements by Sphingomonas, because this is a biosignature. It's a signature of um, biological interactions with rare earth elements that you don't see in non-biological controls. And it raises questions as to whether enrichments of certain rare earth elements by biology might be a way, for example, to search for life on other planets like Mars. It are looking at uh, rare earth elements, a way to look for um, signatures of life elsewhere. I'm going to come back to that in a second. So what is the mechanism of bioleaching here? Well, this is something we're looking at in our lab at the moment. Many microorganisms leach elements by acidification. So in biomining, microorganisms release protons and acids. They acidify the medium. And as a result, elements are released from the rocks. That is not the case in our experiment because the pHs of our experiment remain neutral during the experiment. They are acidified during the fixative stage. That is how the microorganisms are stopped from growing by acidification. But if anything, the experiments are slightly alkaline during the main experimental phase. So it's not acidification. We think that the reason why we have bioleaching is that Sphingomonas desicarbolis produces lots of extracellular polymeric substances or extracellular Polysaccharides. polysaccharides. In fact, it's a prolific producer of these polysaccharides that are exuded into the solution. And interestingly, there's a paper going back to 2007 where this group looked at rare earth element uh, sequestration in natural environments by bacteria. And they showed that there was a, an enhancement in heavy rare earth elements caused by microbial mats and polysaccharides. So our hypothesis following this paper is what we're seeing is the binding of positively charged rare earth elements 
to the negatively charged moieties and possibly sulfate moieties as well on the polysaccharides. And we're also seeing this signature of preferential binding of heavy rare earth elements onto the polysaccharide. And this is the next hypothesis we want to test um, here on the earth in the laboratory. But I bring up this question again of whether in fact this is also pointing towards an interesting biosignature. Rare earth elements are not normally discussed as a potential biosignature of life on Mars, but perhaps these sorts of experiments uh, might, might give us some clues as to uh, another way to look for the activities of microbes in rocks. And intriguingly, in this experiment, we also did this experiment, of course, in Martian gravity. So as far as I know, this is the first experiment to look for a, or to demonstrate a biosignature of life under Martian gravity conditions. And of course, we can have an argument about whether that Martian gravity is really a significant factor in the context of that sort of scientific question. But nevertheless, I think it's just an intriguing spin-off from the biorock experiment is the demonstration of um, a biologically enhanced signature of elements under Martian gravity conditions, and is this something worth pursuing for, uh, for Martian exploration? Just to come back to our, our commercial applications again, the, uh, this is just a table, uh, not very helpful, there's a lot of numbers here. This is just to show the rare earth elements and the percentage extracted as a percentage in our basaltic slide. And you can see that the numbers uh, are on the order of sort of 0.01% and higher. Uh, typically in commercial operations, in, in the literature, people have demonstrated rare earth element extraction by microbes running from eight times 10 to the minus three up to tens of percent. So our experiment is at the lower end of what one would actually want for commercial, um, commercial application. But of course, remember this is not an optimized biomining setup. It's a scientific experiment. We did not crush our rocks because we wanted to look at biofilm formation, which is something we're working on that data we're writing up at the moment. Uh, if you were doing this commercially, you would crush up the rock before you presented it to the microorganisms. So again, there, there are ways in which this would be optimized for real practical use. But nevertheless, you know, we're still even, even with this suboptimal setup at the lower end of, of yields demonstrated on the earth. And the significance of this was it, it was the first biomining experiment, in fact, the first mining experiment in space and the first demonstration of biomining under altered gravity regimes. So how would you go off and do this elsewhere? Well, I mentioned earlier the Oceanus Procellarum region of, of the moon, this big black area that you can see on the near side, and it has these creep rocks, and creep rocks were formed by almost, uh, um, trying to think about how best to describe this, a sort of fractionation, if you like, of elements when the moon was formed. So when there was a basalt or a, a lava ocean on, on the moon, a magma ocean, uh, elements were fractionated out, and on the moon, the history of the geology is such that you, you end up with this region where rare earth elements, which are incompatible with being drawn into the interior of the moon, end up in the surface on these rocks, and you have these creep rocks. Up to 10 times higher rare earth elements than the basalt, typically in the rest of the moon. But I, I just want to, again, uh, to, not to labor the point, but emphasize 10 to 100 times less than REE ores on the earth. So we're not going to go to the moon to, to mine rare earth elements to bring them back to the earth. But if you're sitting on the moon with a settlement and you need rare earth elements for your industries, uh, creep rocks would be a good target to remove these elements rather than shipping them up from the earth. We also don't know whether there are higher concentrations at sub-kilometer scales. Our experiments might motivate uh, an interest in, in getting higher resolution on rare earth elements so that we could decide whether there are particular places on the moon where you might want to build a biomining reactor. And then finally, Mars. Mars is an interesting place. Uh, again, I, I won't dwell on this for too long, but most economically interesting elements concentrate in hydrothermal systems. Uh, so most of the ores that we have on the Earth are in volcanic systems where hydrothermal fluids have released elements from rocks, precipitated them out, and caused them to solidify. And not just volcanic hydrothermal systems, also asteroid and comet impact craters as well. So the Sudbury impact crater in, in Canada, which is a 2.8 billion year old crater, has one of the world's largest nickel mines. So even craters on the earth have these ores. So in theory, given the, the huge volcanic systems like Olympus Mons, the Tharsis region, and the lack of plate tectonics, which means there are very large impact craters still on the surface of Mars. In theory, Mars should be covered in all sorts of economically interesting ores. And probably the reason why we don't see them is because of course Mars is covered in this ubiquitous red dust and we have not yet prospected 
beneath the subsurface? So this is an interesting question. Uh, some people might find it uh, an ethically questionable uh, thing to look into. I'm not gonna, really gonna address that in this talk, you know, whether we want to do mining on Mars, but purely from a scientific and, and, and geological point of view, in theory, there should be ores on Mars that you could in theory mine. Of course, the question of whether you want to do that and whether people are, are comfortable with that is another question um, altogether. All so, so we may, for example, be able to go to these creep rocks on the moon and extract rare earth um, elements. I also wanted to finally say that uh, we have some other data that we're working on at the moment. We were able to successfully demonstrate the biomining of vanadium. And I have to be honest with you, I had no interest in vanadium before our experiment came back from space station. And then we looked into it after we got our results. This turns out to be a surprisingly interesting element. You put it in iron and steel to make high strength alloys that are very abrasion resistant and is resistant to thermal fluctuations. And of course on the moon and Mars, one of the problems you have is lunar dust that's very abrasive, same on Mars as well. And lots of thermal fluctuations on the moon and Mars where diurnal temperatures are very extreme. So getting vanadium out of rocks could be of interest. It's also used in metals as it's a very efficient neutron absorber. So it's used in nuclear reactors. So one might think about that. When I presented this to um, the NASA Cube Center, which is interested in, um, in using microorganisms to extract uh, ele elements or make um, products on the moon and Mars, we had a very interesting discussion on biomining of vanadium and how useful that would be. So this is also just another element we're looking at. And again, you might think about this from the point of view of how microbes process vanadium and its potential as a, um, uh, as a, as a biosignature. So where next? Um, we are flying a new experiment uh, in less than a month now, hopefully if there's no delays. Uh, December the 2nd is the plan, but it might be delayed depending on whether Crew-1 gets off on time. This is interesting. Uh, it's the first commercial mining experiment, truly commercial, because we're flying with Bioreactor Express, which is a commercial service where instead of going through ESA, you pay up your money and you buy time on the cubic centrifuge. So we got some money from our university and we've essentially bought three weeks time in the cubic centrifuge. And we've gone through this program. We've organized this in a year, as I said earlier. This is very quick. And what we're doing now is removing the basalt and we're looking at microbial interactions with asteroid material instead of basalt. And this will just be focusing on microgravity. In this experiment, we're gonna be looking at Sphingomonas again, our, our uh, organism that we used in BioRock. But we're also looking at Penicillium simplicissimus, which is a fungus that is uh, already being used in biomining uh, experiments. And then in a third set of experiments, as part of this experiment, we're also mixing Sphingomonas desicarbolis and Penicillium to look at a miniature community. And it's part of a general scientific interest in trying to understand communities in space, artificial ecosystems, if you like, of communities and looking at biosignatures in space and how microbes interact. And in this experiment, we're going to be doing exactly the same thing, looking at the investigation of the leaching of elements. I should just say, finally, one of the things that I'm very much in favor of is repeating lots of experiments using the same hardware. There tends to be this excitement in space research to com continue building new apparatus and doing new experiments. And one can understand why people have that excitement. But one of the things that's actually lacking in the literature is using the same apparatus and just flying it over and over again with the same sorts of organisms, answering slightly different questions and really trying to get good robust data. So here we're looking at microgravity again, and again with Sphingomonas desicarbolis, uh, but with a different rock. And so incrementally building on the data we got from BioRock and hopefully building up a sort of robust quantity of data rather than just constantly changing apparatus. So now we'll be able to compare these data with the BioRock experiment and, and start to sort of build a, a deeper understanding of the effects of microgravity on microbial interactions in space. So all this work has been funded by the UK Space Agency and the Science and Technologies Facilities Council in the UK, to whom I'm very grateful to. Um, also, we've had, of course, the support of the European Space Agency to fly these experiments, and Kaiser, who built the, Kaiser Italia, who built the uh, hardware themselves. So I'm gonna stop there. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, as I say, it's not really origins as such, but it's sort of more of an applied area of astrobiology, but I hope it's given you some ideas of space experiments and some fundamental ideas about micro-mineral interactions as well. So thank you very much, Inga, for inviting me to talk today. <laughs>
thank you very much, Charles. So it was a very interesting, very interesting lecture, and it's it's really nice to see all these different aspects, uh, especially this space applications. Um, so, are there any questions from the audience? I mean, I have a few questions, but are there any questions here on Zoom? I have one. Yeah. Can you introduce yourself quickly? Uh, hi, uh, I'm Eloy. Um, I'm one of the Origin Center fellows. Uh, my supervisor is Ingalus herself. And uh, I know Charles because I used to be a PhD student uh, under Nick Lane in London, so all UK-based yes. scientists. Um, but my question, Charles, uh, very good talk, as always. Uh, I know that you mentioned that photo uh, autotrophs were hard to send there, but I'm surprised that you didn't send uh, any chemo um, lithotroph. Yeah. I because mean they all interact with metals a, a lot. Absolutely. No, that's a very good point. And, you know, many biomining organisms like Cidithiobacillus are autotrophs and iron oxidizers. Um, having said that, you know, there are many organisms used in biomining that are heterotrophs. So it's not just the autotrophs that do biomining. Heterotrophs um, excrete organic acids. They use organic materials and turn them into organic acids, such as turning glucose into gluconic acid. They produce polysaccharides, which is what I presented there. So it's not, it's not mm -hmm. completely the case that uh, only autotrophs are used in biomining. Heterotrophs show great promise in biomining and have been explored by uh, many research groups and, and I should say corporations as well uh, in applications in biomining. We chose those organisms uh, because another aspect again, which is a bit of a compromise is that you need things that are gonna reliably work in space and autotrophs uh, some of them are quite fickle. They need particular conditions. Acidithiobacillus mm -hmm. needs acid conditions. If you start launching acids into space station, you have serious health and safety problems with containment. So there are all these other aspects of launching a space experiment. If you tell NASA and ESA you're going to launch a nice pH two or three acid solution yeah. <laughs> microbes in the space station, it's not that it's impossible. We actually didn't try, but we certainly didn't get particularly enthusiastic responses many years ago when we considered those organisms. So these are some of the other aspects of planning an experiment. But I would say, you know, generally, it's not that much of a compromise because heterotrophs are of intrinsic interest themselves in terms of their interactions with rocks and how they uh, remove elements from rocks. But it's a good question. Thank you. Right. No, no, it's just my uh, ignorance about biomining and mining in general. So, um... Great, I had no idea. Um, and the other question, uh, I guess it's a little bit more difficult to answer, but how difficult, let's imagine in 30 years or 20, we have like a good moon or Mars settlement. Um, how difficult would it be to control these microbial communities in the long term? Not just because we might contaminate them, but let's assume we are perfect and we never contaminate and change them. They will naturally speciate, I would imagine, after yeah. a long time. How I'm, difficult is that? I mean, these are all really good questions. And in some, I mean, they are microbiology questions, but in some sense, they're engineering questions as well. And, I, and the simple answer to your question is, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, they will species. <laughs> and if you put them in a, in, a, in a biomining reactor, for example, that does not have very thick walls or is covered in regolith, they will be exposed to higher levels of radiation that might cause mutation, mm. speciation. I mean, all of these are, are fascinating questions, and it would be interesting to know how microbes evolve and change when you grow them on the lunar surface. In fact, we're currently trying to propose to ESA as part of their large lunar lander mission, a bio mission to look at exactly these sorts of questions directly on the lunar surface. So I think there are enormous engineering questions. And I certainly wouldn't claim, I wouldn't want anyone to think that I was saying, well, now we've demonstrated this on space station, great, we're ready to go to the moon and bio mine commercially. <laughs> this is a tiny step. I think it's an exciting step myself. I guess I would do, it's my experiment, but I do think it's exciting to demonstrate a Agreed. proof of concept, but there's a lot of there's a lot of work to do if you are going to actually implement this on a larger scale on the moon. But as you rightly point out, these sorts of experiments motivate further science questions. How do communities and species of microbes adapt on the moon? What is the long term fate of them under radiation pressure? Uh, what happens if you contaminate communities? How do communities develop? under altered fluid and radiation environments on the moon. None of this is known and it's all uh, fascinating science to do.
Awesome. Thanks. I think you're muted. No, we didn't hear you, Wesso. Can you put right. it in the chat? No, I, uh, um, so there's a question through uh, our YouTube stream by uh, Paul Mason. I don't know if you met Paul Mason. Yes, He's I know Paul, yeah. yeah exactly. Hello, Paul. <laughs> so his question is, can you explain us more about how microbes preferentially liberate uh, a high rare earth element over the uh, L rare earth elements uh, during microbe mineral rock interactions? Yeah, <laughs> it's a fascinating question. The answer is, <laughs> I don't know. And if anyone has any suggestions, we got our data back and this was only, um, you know, analyzed in the last few months. We saw this enrichment in heavy rare earth elements. We then found in the literature this intriguing paper showing the same effect in uh, natural communities. And it must be something to do with the, um, you know, the atomic radius of those ions and their interactions with phosphate and sulfate uh, groups in the in the um in the polysaccharide and i think the next step is to try and understand the physics and chemistry behind this and unfortunately the paper that suggested this they don't really explain the uh the physics of why this was the case they simply see this in a natural community and suggest that this is a biosignature of life without explaining the chemistry so i would welcome any thoughts any refutations of that idea from physicists and chemists and certainly we ourselves intend to follow this up in the lab uh, to try and understand you know, whether this can be replicated and whether it actually has practical implications. I mean, can you use this sort of phenomenon to um, preferentially extract particular rare earth elements out of a fluid? So I think that's a very interesting question. So that's an unsatisfactory answer, Paul, but, but uh, I would welcome any, any views from chemists about why that might happen. Are there any other questions? Let's try again. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Great. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Um, yeah. Thanks for your talk. One question I had was uh, slightly related to what Eloy just uh, asked. But within these these three weeks of, of the experiments, did you already see or check for or maybe expected some uh, evolutionary or genetic adaptation to the to the gravity situation? Yeah. That's that's a really also an excellent question. We we. Did, our experiment was not focused on genomics, but we are going to be looking at transcriptomics with the bioasteroid experiment. So we fixed it actually with Notox histo, which is quite aggressive to DNA and RNA. We did actually try to get the DNA and RNA out of it just to see whether we could do that. But it was not it was not the plan from the beginning. But in fact, we weren't able to. I think over the period of three weeks, I would be surprised if there was uh, a genomic evolution in that short period of time, just because it's a short experiment, they grow up to exponential phase and then they stop growing. We're not doing multiple generations. Uh, there's a very in intriguing experiment from um, Craig Everode at NASA Ames, and he is looking at multiple generations of bacillus on space station to look at evolutionary changes. So the point you raise is a very good general scientific question, but it's not something we were looking at in this experiment. We will try and look at transcriptomics in bioasteroid to understand what genes are being expressed when these organisms are interacting with rocks. But there again, that won't be an evolutionary experiment as such. And going back to Eloy's question, I, 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 say I do think that's a fascinating area. I think growing um, microbes either in ISS or even better in the lunar environment where there's higher natural levels of radiation and exploring the impact of these extraterrestrial environments on long-term populations and their genetic structures would be a, uh, an excellent direction to go in. Okay, thank you. So we have uh, time for a few more questions. Maybe I can uh, relate to the question of Vesso and Eloy, because I was thinking about, in principle, it's a short, it's only three weeks, but then being kind of ignorant with this field, I, I, and I thought to understand that in space, the mutation rate is much higher because of, um, all kind of effects. Is that true? And, and, and I guess, doesn't that sort of, couldn't that potentially change the interpretation of how much this population would evolve? Yeah, again, uh, yeah, that's, a, I mean, that's a nice point. It's very difficult to quantify with our organisms. If you are exposed to higher levels of radiation, you, you would think you would have higher levels of mutation, but that would also depend upon the rate of repair in the organisms. It's not quite as simple as just saying higher radiation, high mutation, although statistically, you know, just like, 
um, you know, human cancer rates and high radiation, you would expect a higher rate of mutations. I think the question is, you know, do you, um, do you see that over a three week period? Of course, you could extract the DNA at the beginning and the end of the experiment and see whether you see fixed mutations in the population. My intuitive sense would be that over three weeks, that's quite a short experiment. One wouldn't see radical changes or, or maybe any significant changes at all. But the reality is I don't have the data to tell you that for certain. Um, so, so I think, again, it's an interesting question. You know, what are the timescales over which evolutionary changes occur in populations of organisms in these higher radiation extraterrestrial environments? And these are things for which we have very few experiments. Most, most microbiology experiments on space station are relatively short. Uh, it's only recently that people have started thinking about doing evolutionary experiments on ISS. I mentioned Craig Everose's experiment, which actually flew on the same mission as ours. So people are now doing these experiments of looking at the, the genome um, of organisms. And I guess these experiments have only come about just because of cheap whole genome sequencing, uh, which isn't exactly new, but you know, it's only during the last few years people have been able to do that relatively cheaply. And that's made possible the idea of looking at many different experimental replicates from somewhere like the space station and looking at these evolutionary changes. So I think you raise a very good question. And um, I think there will probably be many groups working on that in the coming years and decades in space facilities, and we'll start to get ideas. And it might be interesting in future to, to do an experiment on Sphingomonas and then backtrack and interpret what might have happened during the BioRock experiment. Yes. Are there any uh, other final questions, maybe? Maybe if there's no one else wants to ask yeah. a question. I was just curious because you get to do one experiment every 10 years, which is kind of, I mean, yeah. it's changing now. But to me, it seems like this, how do you deal with that fact and then having to pick an organism? Yeah. So this, this is, is an infinitely large diversity in the in on Earth, and then you have to pick ten organisms that you choose and do the experiment with. How do you do that? Yeah. Okay. So just to take the first part of the question. How do you deal with this? One every ten years. You you don't uh, build a research group that depends on space experiments. Is a simple answer to that. Uh, so I do other astrobiology experiments. The space experiments are like the icing on the cake. <laughs> you know you. You have the odd PhD student every now and again who works on it. It's quite difficult to plan these experiments because you can't have a single PhD student. You, could, you should never put a PhD experiment on one of these, a PhD student on one of these experiments totally as well, just because if it doesn't fly, then they don't get their PhD done. So these are difficult things to do over these time scales. Uh, so you run them in parallel with whatever else you're doing. And then, you know, eventually you get the prize of flying your experiment and the excitement of doing that. Like I mentioned earlier, this is changing now. So the bioasteroid experiment we planned in a year and the, the number of launches into space and the, the cost of doing this is such that I think that if you were a PhD student now or a postdoc and you thought I wanted to build a research group for the rest of my career that's gonna explore experiments in microgravity or space radiation, that would be a much more viable thing to think about than when I was early in my career because you really could if you got the funding be launching experiments every year and reliably getting data that PhD students could work on. So, so this commercial space access is really a change of paradigm for scientists and thinking about scientific questions because it enables a research career that's focused on space biology. I think that's tremendously exciting. I wish it had happened 20 years ago, but you know this is changing now. And for those of you watching this who, who might think this is exciting, I think you can take a different view than thinking about this as a really rare an unusual thing to be able to do and actually think, you know, I might be able to build a career around that. Your second question about picking the microbes, um, there is a very large diversity, but there are only certain microbes that have been studied in the lab and people have shown them to be able to grow in particular media. Uh, they've been deposited in culture collections. So if you do what we've done, which is to ask the question, which microbes would I choose that can grow in the same medium? and can survive desiccation, you actually end up with, a, with not so many microbes to choose from. And microbes that will grow reliably, you don't wanna send them up into space and then have them all die after you've spent 10 years preparing an experiment. So you want really easy to grow microbes, things that are reliable, things which, from which you can extract uh, fluids or DNA, whatever you're doing, and things for which there is a, um, you know, a, a well understood 
set of previous experiments that allows you to uh, reliably prepare these things for a space experiment. So actually there are not that many. There are other micros we could have chosen. For example, we're flying fungus with bio asteroids. So there are certainly options you can have, um, but it's not, it's not a mind boggling number when you actually start whittling down the, the, the microbes that you need for a space experiment. Okay, I have one final question uh, through a different medium because someone, um, uh, Philippe Schoenians from ASA is also listening, uh, but he couldn't uh, post his uh, uh, question on YouTube. Um, so he wondered at the beginning of your presentation, you said that your microorganisms are so small and light that they're probably not much influenced by gravity. Is that, is that is that correct? I think, yeah, I think the general view, I mean, this is still controversial and people discuss it, but I think the prevailing view, and I wouldn't say this is fixed view, is that, uh, you know, a, a, an organism of, of, of one micron in size uh, does, does not have enough int intracellular material to directly detect gravity. So the effect of gravity is an indirect effect through the fluid. When you have large cells, like, um, for example, frog oocyte egg cells, People have shown in microgravity that those are several tens of microns in diameter, that the organelles in there actually settle out in, in gravity compared to microgravity. So people have proposed that the settling out of those organ organelles in those larger cells could potentially be a mechanism or offers the, the, the evolutionary potential for a mechanism for directly detecting gravity in a cell or the lack of gravity, which would then have knock-on physiological effects. But no one has demonstrated in a prokaryote um, direct effects, uh, an in, in internal cell structure that can directly affect gravity. But other people disagree. Some people say that there are biochemical pathways that will uh, be affected, for example, by the uh, behavior of the fluid inside a microbe. You have to remember the fluid is very, uh, a microbe is very heavily crowded inside a cell. It's not a bag of fluid. It's packed full of, of molecules. So it's not it's just sort of sitting there and it, a cell doesn't convect, for example, inside a prokaryote of one micron size. So the fluid inside a microbe is not behaving like bulk fluid. So I think the question is open as to whether a prokaryote can really directly detect gravity or whether all microgravity and gravity effects are actually indirect effects through fluid mechanics. Interesting question again. Yeah, yeah he's a physicist. So that's why the, the question uh, yeah. comes from. <laughs> so if you look at <laughs> physics, there's always gravity, you, right? I understand that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, if, are there any other questions? Because we're near, nearing the end of our uh, uh, webinar slot. Are there any final questions? No, then I, with this, I would like to thank uh, Charles for kicking off our seminar series. It was a really interesting um, presentation and also the interaction was really nice. So all of you, thank you for uh, your questions. Um, and with this, we will close our uh, live session. Um, so we will uh, go offline now. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you.